Thank you and welcome back for game two of Cloud9 versus Gamba Esports as we shift straight back into champ select here. Gamba looking to right the ship after a tough game one loss versus Cloud9. They'll be on the blue side as they'll ban away Aatrox once more. Cloud9 again with the Scion, so maybe looking at a pretty similar start to this draft at least, Spawn. Yeah, and I wonder what the side selection is, whether it's the fact that Kaiser right now does seem to be incredibly strong. I thought that the counter pick for Kira was important. I think that whilst that laning phase went poorly, could have certainly gone worse if he was in the counter matchup. So it's pretty, I think, interesting that, you know, not all that much changes. They do give them the choice now, Urgot or Kaiser to ban away, given the fact that they've taken away the Urgot counter pick for Licorice, which of course is the Aftershock Lissandra. So certainly showing that they do have some ideas here, or they could just trade it. Yeah, Cloud9 thinking, you know what, we'll happily trade, we'll just keep the bans the same, keep Diamond off of the champions he's played. In fact, he has to play another new champion, because they banned Nocturne away from Blabber on their own side. But we'll yep. see what Gambit do want here. If they take Urgot, Cloud9 are 101% taking Kaiser, but Urgot's still a very good first pick. Yeah, it certainly is, and I think that right now you can just take Kaiser and Kindred potentially. Have a good jungle matchup because Kindred does seem to be quite powerful on the current patch. We've seen Blabber play it against the Urgot already and over the course of the game, learn how the interaction works. So he should be able to navigate that one a little bit more successfully. And it gives Cloud9, once again, a response of a powerful pick. Alistar. Huh, interesting. I wonder if they won't take Kaiser here. They'll we'll have to see what Cloud9 do want for themselves. Looks like right now Reaper talking to Sneaky, so maybe just discussing, you know, if we give them Kaisa, what do you want to play? Already played Draven one time around, and Cloud9 starting to really change the playbook. Mark said don't show new stuff, but they picked Akali for the first time ever this tournament. And I wonder if Licorice plays at top lane, whether this he is does. something that he thinks yeah, is a very good does. matchup. There you go. Solo Q scouting, I know. <laughs> He's been rampaging through Korean Solo Q, is one of the few players from the West that's challenger over there, and I know he has been playing Akali from time to time, so perhaps you're right. Maybe thinking that that's where he wants to go with the 1v1 matchup. Gambit, though, are going to take Varus, and looks like TK may be lined up. What I was going to say is now you can still take Kaiser if you want to. Then you can hide your last pick for the other end of the flex, whether it's Akali top or Akali mid, and guarantee a good matchup. First picking jungle out of this rotation wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Neither junglers have been picked up so far, Pastry Time, so I think we're going to go fairly far down the lane in this regard. I have to think so as well. And just with a quick check, I believe this is the first Akali all year, actually, for Cloud9. So I've not played a lot of it at all in the matches they have played. But there is the Kaiser we expected from Cloud9, and we'll see what happens here in Phase 2. In saying that, it is difficult at the best of times to get your hands on Akali. Around the world, she is one of the most heavily banned champions. There seems to be some good matchups that you go towards. Rise LeBlanc, Zillion, as well as Galio have all been shown. Top lane, especially if it's going to be an Urgot matchup, I think that there are certainly ways that Urgot can win that one. If you're able to chunk her out, you can pull her out of the shroud. Looks like John. Interesting adaptation. Yeah, we'll have to see, but of course, we'll look at phase two bans now. All left to ban for Cloud9, continuing to hammer at Diamond's champion pool. Whatever he ends up playing, it is going to be many picks down on his list. And that's interesting, right? Because you think that when you have a look at Blabber's champion pool, he wants to be on something aggressive. And Diamond's played the game for such a long time, so you would think that maybe in a tank versus tank or a team fight matchup, he could gain an upper hand. That game one performance was very impressive from Diamond for the first half of the game. Um, so I think that this is a strategy that I wouldn't necessarily think would be employed by Cloud9. Gone out. Again, Cloud9 is picking on the jungle and Gamma on the other side, banning away tank tops, because you know what? That, like you said, it could still be a flex pick of the Akali if Jensen wants to take the Assassin for one of the rare times he has all year long. Well, the thing is, is as soon as you lock in, you know, not Braum as a support pick, Orn Kaiser just becomes obnoxious to deal with if you have low mobility backline. And Kira doesn't necessarily play the highest mobility mages in the game, you know, more known for these things like Orianna and Nibia. So being able to lock that in would certainly shut down the Varus. Yeah, we did see Hecarim ban. That's kind of a dual ban for top and jungle, but Blabber had to be thinking, hey, I made it through 10 bans, the Kindred's still up. So I guess I'll take that here, as that's the first pick for C9 in phase two. So we'll see how they tie the room together, but Gambit, of course, must finish their draft now. Yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, what comes next down the list. Is it something like a Xin Zhao to try and dictate some early game pressure for Diamond Prox? Does he go towards an old school pick like Lee Sin? 
That's an old school pick. Yeah. Sarah. <laughs> it is one of his most played of all time in Anivia and really did make his mark on Albus Knox Luna with that picker. Absolutely. And blind picking it, especially given the fact that we think that it could be a top lane Akali, is a bold call. I mean, they don't know either. So as far as they're concerned, it's also blind, even if Jensen does end up playing the Akali. Robax continue. Jarvan hovered there briefly by Diamond, but we'll see if he settles onto Zack here. Can be tough to take a tank versus Kindred and is going to take Poppy Jungle. Huh. I like that. Can stop the engage coming out. They have a very control centric composition. Front to back, they will be able to shred through if there is no tank in here. They do have to worry about, you know, potentially some good flanks coming through from whoever the Akali player is, not to mention the fact that there could be not a bad 1-3-1, one, one, but I guess Tom Kent really does attack that. So I think the poppy pick here actually makes a lot of sense. Pastry time, if they can't force with Zazel, if they can't get sneaky into the back line, no one really going to be able to deal with Varus and Ivia from this composition. Yep, Poppy does a great job blocking a lot of the jumps and dashes on the Cloud9 side. Last pick though is Victor. You can see Reaper giving his top lane a big thumbs up, says Licorice, you've earned it. Here's a carry. We'll see, we and get, a, get us through here to game number three with yet another win. But Gambit, I feel like actually drafting a very strong comp for them, not just based on what is kind of present in the metagame right now, but the way their style works and their comfort works, I actually really like what they ended up with, which is impressive given how many bands Diamond ate in this draft. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that given the fact that, you know, you've got a short range AD carry or Marksman coming through for Sneaky, it's going to be difficult to attack turrets. So Kira going to have a field day here. They also have the Poppy and Nivea composition, which once again, I think it was Albus Knox Luna ran in their play in stage that time in the top lane. So some innovation coming through for the first time. This is what we finally wanted to see out of the Gambit lineup. Give us something fresh, try and shake up Cloud9, try and change their play patterns. And I think they've managed to do that. I think so as well. So we'll see what happens here in game number two. It was dominance in the top half for Cloud9 in so much of game one. Looking for a potentially similar trend here as well with two counter picks on their side plus Blabber back on Kindred for a second game in a row. So coaches and sports staff will settle into their positions and watch their teams move out at level one. Because the big thing is normally when you play Poppy, you can't gank mid lane. It's actually one of the hardest lanes to gank. You know, not many walls. They have to seriously misplay for you to be able to get it. With Anivia, you can gank anyone anywhere as Poppy, as long as Anivia forces them in the right direction. So Jensen is going to have to be clued in because seeing Poppy, you would assume low pressure. But there is a lot of chain seeds. See, there is a lot of damage. Pre-6, it comes out of both of those champions. And Kira is a master at the bird. Got to be careful. Sometimes the Poppy just rubs her boots. All of a sudden, she's top speed running into your lane, and you're dead. We did see this, I believe, already from Gambit in MSI, running the Poppy Anivia. Like you said, when you have a player with so much individual mastery on the champion, these are the things you can't afford to do. And if Cloud9 weren't thinking about it or aren't prepared, they will be swiftly punished. In fact, Jensen has heal over cleanse. We'll have to see if he gets huh. punished for that at all. Yeah, that's really interesting. Whilst Kira has the luxury of being able to pick up the spell book. You know, not going towards something like a Comet for the laning dominance. Wants the freedom to be able to swap out some of the spells as the game progresses. And on runes, also Licorice, we did, did see the top of Kali, but a little different from maybe what we've seen in mid lane. He used to be a bit heftier in these matchups versus Urgot, so his primary resolve with Grasp of the Undying actually is the key stone. Yeah, and that makes sense to me because when you play against Urgot, you're pretty much playing against a melee champion that wants to dash in, use the shotgun knees. So we'll have a chance to stack it up, not to mention the fact that he, did he just get the ward? Yeah, he's going to get the ward. I hate this champion. Uh, <laughs> what I was going to say, so you are going to be able to get the proc, not to mention the fact that you also stay in combat a lot just because of your access to creep wave with Shroud as well as the Q. So we'll have it up and available as often as he wants. See the lane here start. Jensen hasn't played Victor in uh, a while. Actually, looks like his first play on the year for the champion, but he's yeah, well versed been, in it. Has been buffed up a little bit. You know, the cause costing 100 gold less is just such an important change for Victor. We were talking about, you know, Future's Market and things like that, helping him out a little bit, but I think this is what needed to push him back in. He also had some pretty lame keystone choices, to be honest, but with Electrocute being nerfed down, you do have a much better trade window when you take something like an Aerie, so I do think that he is in overall a much healthier position than what we've seen. Yeah, we 
Bouncy Blurber there onto the blue, but unfortunately for him, his first bouncy is on the left side, and that's the ward that Sehos already cleared at level one with the Ergo. as Kira with a nice trade. Let's get some damage out onto Jensen, but Jensen trading back there as well. But this time around, as long as he survives the early part of the landing phase, it's going to be Kira that can potentially teleport back in with that spell book. As we mentioned as well, probably should have a little bit more pressure with a Poppy in the lane, so getting pushed in at this stage, not necessarily the worst thing. Blabber on this first scuttle. It's not the one that's with the extra value, but he'll take it regardless as he was on this side. Actually already see an early back from Diamond, has Boots 1 to make sure he can use the Keystone that he brought to battle, which is of course Predator. And we might actually have a race for this scuttle. Jensen pushing us in does give Blabber somewhat of a window, but Diamond is running there and top is pushed on the side of Gambit. And I think uh, Diamond does need to control this top side of the map. You know, you've got an Akali, you've got yourself a Victor into an Anivia matchup. If this doesn't go well, you're in some trouble. Not to mention the fact that Barish just outranges Kaiser, but until level six has very little kill threat. So I think that it's going to be crucial for the bottom lane to just be able to secure the push. Good vision control going to be crucial for Diamond to keep his top laner safe, his mid laner safe. And if they do farm up in a similar fashion, they have very clear windows where they're going to be able to win the game. These two comps do different things. Not necessarily going to be a 5v5 team fighting comp coming out of C9. It's a little bit of a shocking wall there. Uh, so we'll see whether they're able to weather it. Jensen, a bit hungry. Maybe looking to make some omelets, but Kira stays with passive up for now. Blabber also based, has his red spite now picked up. But once again, Kira. Is just down like a creep wave and getting forced out of lane versus Victor, who Patrick Time isn't necessarily known for his lane dominant play patterns. It's also pushing back towards Jensen. So Jensen feels now that he can go for a recall. Kira stays out of vision and is not going to move in to pick it up, but Blabber maybe sees a passive oh, he can could pick be up. Disaster. Oh, Diamond here as well. Blabber's like, oh no. <laughs> As a My good free pass from Diamond, yeah. this is what needed to happen in the first time around. When Kira got stuck underneath that turret, Diamond needed to be able to come in and impact that wave. Didn't do so on the Nocturne, actually ran back through the jungle. Uh, Kira lost two creep waves for it and so much experience, whereas this time around Diamond does the right thing for his mid laner. Kira still got himself in that situation, but it's nice of Diamond to, you know, kind of save him. You can see Licorice is struggling at least early on in this matchup. Stehos up about 10 CS using that strong early power that Urgot does have. This is kind of what happens with a lot of Akali lanes. You try and live, you try and heal up as much as possible as soon as you have access to level 6. Even without Ignite, you have kill threat on nearly everyone. We'll be interested to see how she goes against an Ignite Urgot top lane, who probably is going to come back with a Kindle gem on the first shop, so should be quite tanky as opposed to a lot of the top laners that Akali is able to find. Not to mention in the 2v2, Akali does do a very good job of killing the jungle a lot of the time. Whereas Diamond is going to be very tanky in this game. There's going to be a Cinderhole Poppy coming out, so not necessarily going to be the same impactfulness. Ooh, nice ward actually from Gambit. Spots Blabber flipping through the lane. Kira came back to the lane with no pop pace time. That seems bad. Yeah, I'm, given the trajectory of this landing phase so far, I'm going to have to agree with you. <laughs> Blabber here also back on, I believe, the bounty. As the crab does spawn, but Diamond is going to try and snipe it here. He doesn't even move out. Blabber just smites it and walks away. Now Diamond wants to try and get a kill, but Blabber over the pit flips back and he's fine. And there's nothing Diamond can do. His mid lane is getting pushed in so far that he needs Stehos to be able to rotate across. And uh, nice Kira. Last charge. Jensen going to get some damage down onto the egg as well. Probably not enough to get a kill, but picks up the passive for nothing. Once again, the lane is just in a shocking spot. And this is becoming a real problem for Gambit fans. You cannot fall down this far. We'll have a teleport to get back into lane. Oh. But again, Jensen just trimming the wave, keeping it back. I mean, this is what he was known for for so long. Building up big CS leads just by controlling the wave and outlaning you. Has not done that for quite a while all year long, but is really giving Kira the hands in these first two games as Lodic does TP back down the bot side and Trunkin sneaky away. Does have his heal, holds on to his cooldowns, but he's probably going to be forced out of this lane. Licorice again. That's perfect execution one into Shroud. Stayhouse knows what's up now. Does get the flippy around. Needs to try and flash out of the way, but Blabek here. Ulti is going to miss. Licorice maybe looking to go back through, but Stayhouse flashes out to safety. 
does get the flash but survives a 2v1, which is very good because right now, if you are the Gambit lineup, you must be able to win bot and top very hard. Mid lane is going disastrously. Kira now with the ultimate, if he gets a blue buff, will be able to secure some more farm. Stayhos sticks around. Good vision here from Gambit though, it does mean that Stayhos will be safe and Licorice not that healthy. Although ultimate being down means that he's probably not in too much trouble and still gonna try it. Back into the shroud, Stayhos uses his dash away, Blubber gonna dive him, looking for the first blood one more time and he's gonna grab it. Yeah, and that's just greedy from Stayhos, wanted to still challenge the minion wave, didn't think they could get on top of him. However, Blabber's willingness to burn summoner spells and generate advantages once again comes up crucial for Cloud9. And this time we'll see if Licorice can have a different looking game. Still a good poppy game in game one, mind you, but now on a, a champion that can really snowball things over and is getting the attention this time for Blabber. As we'll take a look at our Acer Predator replay. Yeah, and Sehos just thinks that he's going for the mark. That Licorice does the right thing, calls his jungler back up, gets some maximum distance on Flash Dash there. And I mean, that's a pretty easily executed game. Coming across, and oh, unfortunately for Gambit, their mid laner is now losing. Their top laner has just been equalized after a very impressive early game. Pressure once again on Lodic and Edward to be able to make this game work. And looks like using that bot side pressure to bring Kira and Diamond over. Defense already mounting for Cloud9. Those sneak in Zazel back off. Blabber's on this side of the jungle, and Jensen is going to move back around as well. Once again, a wall. Not connecting there for Kira. And now Kira is very slow. He doesn't have boots pastry time. Doesn't have passive either. Does have his flash, but is already getting ulti by Jensen. Zazel looking to make the combo happen, but Kira does find the good flash. Stun chain there onto Blabba, but he flips out of there and still has Lambs despite going. Here's the Tom Kent. Blabba burns the ulti. Jensen now fighting on the other side, but Gambit, they found the collapse. They'll devour Blabba, and Lodic grabs himself a very important kill. And Gambit fans breathe a sigh of relief. A very nice flash secures himself a kill. It's onto their AD carry. Lodic now has potential to carry out this game. That's the person they needed on 20 CS ahead. Now grabs himself some extra gold as he grabs that kill. And even the bot tower getting low. Diamond actually comfy in the 4v5 to try and 5v4, sorry, to translate onto Dragon. Licorice so looking for some solo action. Flips around, doesn't land the Shuriken though, and again, still some damage down. Lodic with a great chain of corruption. Zazel on the front side, but he's got no ulti and no flash. He's got Ignite. Sneaky boss to burn oh. the heal, but Edward devours him up. That's gonna be another one. This time it's Kira that grabs it. And a kill and assist, exactly what this Anivia ordered. Now all of a sudden, Kira also is feeling pretty good about the pickup, the utility of the Anivia coming up massive. And the bottom lane turret also very low pastry time. So this game on the bottom side of the map could explode at the moment's notice. Gambit have done a great job of sticking to their guns down here in the bottom side. They had one pressure point left after that gank and the double summoner spells burnt. Kira looked like he was in no man's land. He looks like he's between three members, but a very nice flash. It means that they're able to combo out onto this Kindred and maybe forgetting about the Tom Kench ultimate because it's not really used as combat ultimate in these kind of situations all that often. Blabbit goes down, rookie mistake there, splitting for the rest of the team. And then leads to this play, which is arguably bigger. Because this is Lodic in the 2v2 showing how dominant the Varus can be. Zazel obviously not having the ultimate available means that he's taking maximum damage the entirety. And giving it over to Kira means that He's now in a situation where that 30 CS discrepancy is still massive, but not as impact. Certainly softened by all the gold he got, and Gambit got the Infernal off the end of that play as well. So grab the first strike, and it's a spicy one as Gambit looked to mount. A small comeback here in the early game. It did look like, once again, Cloud9 had the pressure, and they will continue to try and snowball. Licorice is going to dive in. Maybe fancy themselves a tower dive. Stay no Flash right now going to get flipped back on the Shroud down. Power hit tags him, and Blabber not quite in position to finish that off. But now Stehos' job is to just not die. He knows that all the pressure is coming topside. He knows that there's no summoner spells from Zazel. So very hard for on the bottom side of the map, especially against the Tarm Kench. So Stehos needs to play this one passively. They will be able to swap the turrets after this one goes down. So as long as he doesn't die, you know, in the next 45 seconds, his job is accomplished and Lodic is now huge. Yep, gets that gold. All that solo first turret gold feeling real good for the Varus who's swiftly running towards that play to the Ruin King. Diamond here gonna clear out this ward. You can see Kira with a bit more mana, a lot easier to clear out the wave and just ignore the victor from trying to harass him. Despite again that CS difference still very good in Jensen's favor. Kira can now push the wave and leave, which is exactly what he wants to do with Diamond. Yeah, and 
since the changes on the trading pattern of Anivia, now you can't just ulti E immediately. Honestly, Anivia is kind of one to nine. Just sucks. You need blue buff. You need to be able to get some points in your other abilities. It's no longer enough to just be able to ult E someone and have an untradeable window. Uh, so Kira being down this far, it is a pretty big deal. He missed a lot of ECCS. He was forced out in situations that I don't think he should have been. But it is important to note that Anivia is a very good champion at this stage of the game. You know, as soon as level 11 comes through and Rod of Ages is stacking up, he is going to be in a power position. One more death, you know, maybe that swings back around again and Jensen regains control of this lane. But for now, the wave clear is going to be pretty oppressive coming out of the Anivia. Yeah, you can see that swap from Gamba as well. He's going to try and force down the next turret here. Cloud9 trying to play catch up, but Kira's actually doing a nice job solo pressuring the mid outer as well. Jensen with the blue buff should be able to wave clear happily, so that will force Kira away, but Stehos here to cover. Jensen is actually going to have to flash that stun. A very good flash. And the good thing about Anivia players is, based on how they angle the wall, they're able to force you to walk a direction afterwards. Jensen gets tunneled into where the stun was going to land, has to burn the summoner spell, so even more pressure being exerted. C9 doing the right thing, they're trying to trade objectives, but given the fact that the Drake hit was already taken away and there is a Rift Herald on the top of the map, Gambit right now always trading up, finally having an impactful early game. Yeah, a huge sweep of objectives taken with the turret trade, taking top outer, taking Rift after that Infernal, and probably enough without Shelly to take down the mid outer as well, but Kira, he's gonna try and force something here, 3v2 for C9 there in the mid lane, but here comes TK once again. Moving Luddick in, he, Edward immediately has to spit him out to safety though, but Blabber took a lot of damage already early. Licorice forced to ulti in, has the next one going. Blabber forced to ulti, but again, he gets chopped by Irvine and put into the meat grinder. And Cloud9 forced to retreat. Zazel with a disengage pole as Jensen. He's maybe left for dead here with no flat. Good slow from Stayhouse. They try and run him down. Licorice is here, he's gonna maybe try and save his friend, but he can't do it at all. And now, in fact, in danger of having to burn the flash, does save it, but Gambit once more come out on top. And heads up play out of time and gets him back in vision holds the summoner spell until the very last moment able to charge him into the wall and another turret falling down herald still in the back pocket and a meaningful gold lead right now for gambit 2000 gold ahead looking good so far for what looks like again a pretty tough spot in the mid lane as far as the early game goes but they come together they play with the picks that they are comfortable with and this is the kind of thing that happens and the swing point as we actually take another look at that play is going to be the fact that there's no flash available. So Jensen takes a lot of damage at the start of the fight. They can't disengage because they've already committed. Calm Kench is just such a versatile champion, able to continue that fight. And, uh, maybe some mistimed aggression coming from Blabber as he flashes forward, thinks that he's safe with the ultimate. Hasn't got the QSS yet, so obviously falls down. This is a flash I'm talking about. Flash, you would think a charge is going to come across. No, hold the cooldown. Make sure that you guarantee the wall bang and able to pick up the kill. Yep. So scoop it up there. In fact, maybe Blabber thinking that the bird did not have passive, but not true. Kira will lose it now, but his uh, general headstrong play, which is certainly something Blabber is known for, does cost him in that situation. So Gambit continuing to find advantages. And like you said, with the Rift Herald still ready, should be a pretty free tier two to take down. Absolutely, and the important thing to note, Pastry Time, is this game followed a similar tra trajectory. Kira falling down very far. Sneaky looking like he was surviving, but the difference this time around was with Varus, you have pressure on the turret. And with that pressure vacuum, they were able to just continually draw people down into the bottom lane. Edward, he's fine. Continually able to draw people down into the bottom lane. They got a couple of skirmishes that went in their favor, and they started stacking up the neutrals. Game one, Stehos had the advantage. Diamond was able to get out tanks, but they weren't able to really convert it into anything. The game was being played much heavily, more heavily on Cloud9's side of the map. This time around, they were able to secure themselves those objectives. Second dragon of the game. And without another mid-game team fight going awry, Gambit looked like they have control. And unlike last time, Gambit actually ahead when that team fight does roll around. And the next Drake will be an infernal as Gambit continue to lock down those big neutral objectives. Still waiting on Diamond's Herald. It's looking to run out pretty quickly here. He's gonna have to pick a spot for that pressure soon as C9 camping some brushes, hoping someone takes a lazy path through the jungle, but Gambit just through the lane, probably gonna channel Shelly here and look to try and pressure this tier two turret. 
Now there's kind of two ways that you could do this. With the wave clear, they're probably guaranteed a charge onto the mid lane turret. So they could drop it here. The other thing you can do is try and drop it behind your Urgot and see if he can generate any pressure. As soon as they see people on top lane turret, they just drop it mid lane. They've already cleared out this wave. And if the rotation doesn't come any quicker, this is nearly a turret take that's going to go down. Yep, move Stahos from top as well. So full five for Gambit, plus one there. The charge does come through from the Herald. Oh. Kirill's gonna lock down. Jensen finds the stun. Zazel trying to deny them out as he dives into the back line, but Shelly's still up. Actually, a kill already onto Jensen as Diamond found the assassination, and now Zazel, he's put into the grind the next time as Stahos snipes him with fear beyond death. And Gambit is just gonna pressure this inhibitor turret now. Licorice forced to ulti away. And Kira coming up clutch in these team fights, gets a two-man wall. And because Diamond was on the front line, Zazel can't find a way in. Gambit break the base, and they're in firm control. Want pressure too longer. Only 10 seconds on the remaining respawns, given how early we are into this game. But Gambit just busts open the midsection of the map. And now translate towards top. Looks like Abyssal Voyage was used to just make sure the minions moved in the right direction. And Gambit's strong mid-game is going to be very strong when the 20-25 minute mark rolls around. I mean, it's strong now, and the difference between this fight is it's all on their turn. Spellbook uses heal. Just innovation coming out of Kira here. The denial onto the back line for Zazel could not get past Diamond. Gets pulled back in. This fear becomes crucial because you can see the Akali can't use any ultimate charges across the back line. Can't get anything done. Ultimately has to dash out. And uh, Sneaky even burned a summoner spell on the back end of that one pastry time. So now all of the carries apart from Jensen really sitting ducks. And without Flash, Zazel just can't guarantee his combo. Gonna have to get creative with the Hex Flash perhaps, but Cloud9 left stuck trying to find something. Zazel does look mid lane, but Gambit playing back towards their turret. Still have the mid outer to protect themselves. In fact, C9 only one turret to the five that Gambit have managed to accrue already. Up over 4,000 gold, looking in 30 seconds to get full control around the Baron area as Lodic plops down a control ward in the pit. And we've seen Cloud9 have to play on the back foot before. We'll see if they can do it here again, because Gambit are in full control right now. Yeah, but I think this Cloud9 composition is much harder to execute than the Lissandra composition. Lissandra was able to buy so much time on the back line, you know, with the ultimate, with the Zonya's Hourglass, had a lot of control. And uh, this time around, they're relying on Jensen to be able to do that. And whilst that's fine, normally with a Victor, uh, against Anivia, we've just seen the wall come up clutch time and time again. This was a pick that Jensen actually took into the Anivia, and it looked good during the laning phase. Actually, he won out on the lane very hard. But Anivia now in very firm control. Thought the Diamond might look for something there. And the other thing that we don't normally talk about with Anivia is since a change to a ultimate damage on neutral objective takes things like Baron like really quickly as well. Obviously you have to worry about mana concerns, but with the Blade of the Ruin King, Ginsu's user on Varus, if they ever win a team fight, you know, or just pick Blabber. Baron becomes a very real objective for this team, not just Turret. And that's uh, music to Gambit's ears, certainly. They're a team that has always played around Baron. As ulti out, gonna find a pick. Sneaky dead already. Lodic just finds the snipe. And now Zazel left out to dry on the front side of the fight. C9 trying to find something as Blabber peppers Edward with arrows. But Gambit have got more than enough coverage. They will get out safely. And they'll take the pick. And no ultimate use from Blabber this time. They still knew that they could rip him back if needed. And you can see that this uh, Gambit lineup right now is just rolling. Their siege underneath turrets is so strong. And I like the fact that this time around, they didn't overcommit. They took the one pick they were willing to back away. Stan finds Blabber. He jumps away, so no range can be found. But Gambit have started the Baron. This might be enough space for Gambit to just take down a very early objective. I think they know they're on it. Yeah, you don't have Kira there for a while. As Abyssal is going to ride Edward in, but it's just him as Blabber. He's going to get forced out. Licorice trying to find the dive. He wants Diamond. It's so low. He finds it. Perfect execution. Dashes in for the assassination. And now it's Cloud9 that might look to take the Baron, but Gambit still continuing the fight. Zazel with a big four-man pole. Does find a good action on the front side of the fight. Cloud9 going to chase them away from the area. A sneaky back off the respawn. Yeah, and really smart disengage coming out of Gambit there because without Diamond, Zazel can just continually look for access into that back line. They will back away. Blabber checked the Baron health as well, knew it wasn't going to go down all that quickly, was able to get back over the other side of the pit. And that's a mistake one more time from Gambit in the mid lane. Didn't turn as a five-man unit, which meant that Cloud9 able to bring back a team fight. And saying that 30 seconds next on an Infernal Dragon Sneaky is top lane. 
I think that is still an objective too far gone, but if we take another look at it, it's just Edward that comes in, doesn't bring Stehos. Lodic stays on the objective. Diamond has to use the flash and still falls down. A couple of things going pretty poorly there. They trade back okay with object, uh, with some of the spells in the end. But uh, that's why the poppy is so crucial. You saw immediately Kira's ultimate stop. Zazel just has so much pressure in these fights if poppy isn't there. And unfortunately for Cloud9, they did get the pick. They delayed the Baron attempt from Gambit. But they don't have vision back around the Infernal. They didn't get a turret to try and give themselves more room. So Gambit, really, yes, they'll lose their chance at Baron. They'll lose some gold as they gift over Diamond to the team. But still in basically the same situation they were a couple minutes ago. Yeah. And once again, starting the objective. Absolutely. They have to resort out their waves. They have to get a fresh set of wards in the top side of the jungle. But in theory, everything else is completely fine for this lineup. So maybe set themselves a couple of minutes of wasted time, but you know, that's two Infernal Drakes. That's going to be a Varus and Nivea composition that uses the scaling incredibly well. And still in firm control, as you mentioned, Pastry. Something else would have to go monumentally wrong because that was just a small misstep. Well, you can see Licorice back with TP to the bot side of the map. He's getting that wave reversed for Cloud Knight. Gambit continuing to apply vision around Baron. Know that they need to continually present this threat to Cloud9, and if they ever slip up, that Baron will die pretty quickly. Nice ward left side of Baron, though, from Cloud9, trying to get themselves the vision. And Kaiser checks it, but knows now that there is no one there at the moment. Yeah, and that ward's a little bit further up because most of the time you do sweep to the top of the corner now. So they are trying to get a little bit clever with it where they're positioning their wards. I think that if Hero and Diamond actually go to the choke point next time as opposed to around the wall, they have a much better position to be able to cut people off. Funneling between Raptor Camp and Red Buff, not often talked about, but Anivia's wall is so big at this stage of the game that it will cut off the entire area. Oh, actually Blabber looking for Edward here, but Diamond also available, pretty low with the stun onto Blabber. He's gonna go down in one CC chain. And Sayos still ready with the ulti, so it's going to be Zazel served up next. Here's Licorice going to try and save the back end of the fight, but Fear Beyond Death will snipe one as Sayos grabs the double. I mean, Licorice, what can you possibly do here? As Jensen is cut off by a wall, dancing around the Anivia Storm, oh. and that's another great stun from Kira. Heal out there from Jensen to try and save his life as Licorice has dove in to try and do something in the fight, but he's going to get wall banged by the Poppy and take it down by Kira, and Gambit can do no wrong. Looking to continue the fight, not able to find Sneaky, but they will take the turret pastry time. And you can see how well the Poppy works against the whole comp. Licorice comes available for one second in the smoke, gets tackled out of it. All of a sudden, a step fast present comes up, can't dash back in. Just so much going on here. They're going to take the recall, not going to greet out for the Baron this time around, just taking the advantages and continuing to grow the lead. Yep, they grab gold, they go back, they spend it, and they'll run back to the pit for another go around. As we'll watch this one again. Blava really wanted this kill. And look at how much work the wall is doing. Zazel, once again, thought he had the initiation, gets knocked out of his headbutt pole combo, gets bought in. Jensen has to run away from the spear, and then Licorice is just trying to buy time, but the wall cuts off the entire choke. Jensen doesn't want to burn Summoner's spells. In the end, has to use heal. This is what I'm talking about. He's technically in smoke. He gets tackled out of it. Steadfast present goes up between him and the Shroud. And uh, Diamond just playing these team fights, even though he's 1-1-6. One, one, like a madman. Still 70% kill participation and doing what he needs to do for his team. Stayos also having a field day on this Urgot right now. Blabber again, looking for someone. The jungle is not a bad pick, but Edward is going to stave them off. Has the Devour to keep Diamond safe, so Cloud9 can have to wait it out. They do have the Speed Shrine Vision around the Baron, so they know Gambit's not on it right now, but that threat will continually be presented until something breaks in this game spawn. And they need a couple more items. You can see that Jensen has got towards his Rhylice. He should have more control in these fights, but still hasn't got himself a Void Star. Edward face check. Trying something again, Edward. Pretty tanky. Ulti is going to get moved out by Sneak. I think he might have flashed out of the way, but Zazel already too low. Baby on death grabs him again. Stehas with the snipes as Licorice is trying to dive the carries here, but he's out of ult charge. He's now forced to flip away. Lodic with a wonderful flash. Insane outplay by the Gambit AD carry.
Sorry, and Cloud9 again left to defend their inhibitor as Gambit charged into the base. Yeah, this time Lodic is low, but they're going to look to take the inhibitor down. Sneaky doing what he can on the back end of this, but right now it seems like they're too far ahead. Oh, Jensen Flash is good. But again, the War Plus Poppy threat was there. And now Stayoff is just going to dive the Nexus Tower. It's Blabber. He's ready to defend. He's got his ulti. They might actually find a counter kill here. Stayoff finally goes down as Blabber puts the Respite up at just the right time. And Gambit, have they gone too far again, Spawn? Looks like that's the case. Sneaky doesn't have ultimate. The disengage is going to be secured by Kira. But without your AD carry, Pastry, I don't think you should be diving Nexus Tower. Stayoff's feeling it at the moment. He's 6-2-2. Two two. But uh, that was a meaningless death. Certainly was. But once again, the team fight starts off. Edward face checking. As you said, he's pretty tanky at this stage of the game. And the wall just cuts Sneaky out of the fight. Unless he wants to use ultimate immediately, cannot get in. This is a nice beginning for Licorice. He forces three members back. However, a very beautiful flash out of Lodic, as you mentioned. Gets him to a little bit more safety and ensures they win that fight. I think they should have just taken the inhibitor. The fact that they were willing to continue past it without Lodic here, who is so much of the gold lead, is a little bit of a worrying sign. If this flip lands, you probably do kill Jensen, but I don't think you can end the game still. And if it misses, then you get forced out of the base. Once again, you give a small advantage back. And it's not losing them the game right now, but it is just making the game become a little bit more protracted. Sneaky's picking up half items here or there. Once again, if he gets towards the three, four item mark, this is going to be a difficult game to execute upon. And not habits that Gambit want to build, given that we could be in for a long series with the stakes so high. Inhibit mid also still up, so Cloud9 didn't even lose that and open up an additional bit of pressure. However, check the right hand side of your map. Infernal up in under 10 seconds. Oof, Gambit will Infernal. stack their third if they can take it. I feel like Cloud9 they have to give. Buy it. You have to give? Yeah, you gotta give. It feels so bad to give here. I mean, I, I agree, but there's no way in like two items plus components you're going to be able to win this team fight. I think they use it to control vision, continue try and buy some time. Because really, that's what you're doing. You're racing against the clock. You won a game against Infernal, uh, sorry, Elder Drake Baron. Triple Infernal whilst a hassle. <laughs> Till the Nexus goes down. Certainly does not win you the game. You heard it here first. Just a hassle, folks. As Jensen barely going to miss out getting slow, but Gambit again back to the scene of their last crime. Casino ready with a potential flank play blabber. And you see they've learned their lesson. They can't move through that choke point. Kira not in vision, but if they step forward, he just takes out everything. Another flank here from Licorice, though. It's not Lissandra, but he maybe can make something happen. Eyes on Lodic. Inhibitor will fall down. Cloud9 do not leave to defend it. Diamond in, but it's actually going to get knocked around. He's Ooh. dead. That was too far forward. Now 5v4 for Cloud9. And he put up the steadfast presence. He thought that he had a way to deny the engage. But as soon as that happened and it fell off, then Zazel was just waiting to take out the whole team. Diamond has to go forward. Cost him his life. But once again, Cloud9 just buying time. I feel like I keep going back to it. But Gunblade, you know, QSS finally there for Blabber. Do they just actually try and take this Baron? They've got less than 20 seconds, but they are going to try something here. Gambit must defend Anivia, not bad in this spot, but the Baron is dying very quickly. They're gonna go back in, they look for the engage, they find Seos, the wall cuts off half a cloud nine as Licorice dives into the back side of the fight. They're actually gonna try and cut him off. Licorice, he's just buying time. He's on to Lodic, that's cloud nine Baron. But Licorice, can he magic his way out of there? He's dancing around his shroud, PE1 over the wall as he flashes out for the rest of it. And C9 needs to run. Abyssal Voyage there, he's gonna try and cut off Sneaky, but he KIs away. Still dead though as Lodic finds a snipe. And Jensen is just gonna try and cut them off. A good flip from Seos, but he's been left out to dry by the rest of his teammates. Seasel re-engaged, that's the kill for cloud nine. And Kira just couldn't go with the team, not that mobile. Cloud9 take the one for one trade, take the Baron, and pastry time. They might be back in the game. I mean, it was what, five, six thousand gold ahead from Gambit at one point in the game, and Cloud9 have cut it all the way down to about two. And somehow in this game, they're the first team to grab the Baron. Take another look at this one. Really nicely played from Licorice. He creates so much space. I said he's not the Lissandra, it's going to be more difficult. But in this situation, the only place to go is forward. Zones Lodic from the entirety of the fight. As long as Licorice is there, Lodic cannot attack anyone else. And because Kira goes into the pit and doesn't choose to flash the wall immediately, 
He is not in the fight. So Gambit continuing this is actually continuing a 3v4. And Stahos realizes that way too late has gone over aggressive for one too many times this game. Cloud9 okay. can start believing again. Yeah, I mean, they hold on to Baron on four. Sneaky did die, but he's three items, three items for Jensen. Working towards that as well for Licorice. And now finally able to start a siege here. Stayos forced to dash away. And at mid out of turret at 32 and a half minutes is finally claimed by Cloud9. And you have to talk about standing gold because they're able to also grab top out of turret as well. They get it back within a thousand. The split push is still going to be there for Licorice. He's approaching the three item mark as well. And can he kill Stahos? Probably not. But Stahos wants to be there for the team fights. That's what this composition does. And look to Lodic again. Yes, it will be tougher than Akali. Straight diving onto your face. But he has four items. He is the man that has been set up for zero and nine. He is the person that Gambit have put their faith in all year long to deliver. And deliver he must if Gambit want to tie up this series. And really, Kira has to be able to set the stage for the fights. These walls need to start separating people. He needs to start, once again, burning the flashes on people like Zazel, like Jensen, so they have a way into it. Because we've seen that Diamond isn't all that tanky at this stage of the game. He's only getting jungle resources. And Blab is doing a better job of farming up as they go for the fight. Ooh. And Zazel actually, I think, just engaging to maybe disengage, but they're actually going to turn it back around. A TP in the middle of the fight is Stahos. He's in there, and Blab is kicked out by Diamond's ulti. I don't think that's who you wanted to ultimate, Diamond. They had him cut off. They had the wall there. Probably could have got a summoner. Didn't see whether the A uh, e Q was still available, the hop. But once again, they throw the Hail Mary. That is the ultimate as well as teleport used out of Stahos. Doesn't have the flash available. They come up with nothing. Cloud9 cut the turret lead in half at least. Six to three now, still up in favor of Gambit. Gold lead though, about a thousand between the two. Mid and Hib should be respawning pretty soon, as you can see, 50 seconds away. And just in time for Cloud9 to contest for this Elder. Because you said they could give three Infernals. I don't know if they can give this Elder as well. Yeah, you can't give the Elder Drake once you've given the three Infernals. I tend to agree with you there, Page Time. It's also going to be difficult now that Baron is expired to push into the Anibia. So once again, they've given a lot of their lead back, but they still have the meaningful parts of it, you know, the multiplicative scaling, the ability to just draw this game out for as long as they need it to go. And the problem at 35 minutes is you're now one mistake away from losing the game in its entirety. And it was the lead that Gambit had that in other situations would have been a pretty high percentage to convert for a win. Say Cloud9, try and drag it back to 50-50 as far as they can. Gambit, though, still pressuring. A couple super waves left for the inhib. Now going to respawn. Cloud9 will have to clear out one more wave. And then it's a race to this Baron. As Ligrish has found himself a pretty creative flank spot, but an ulti from Lodic. He's going to start the CC chain up. Blabber with a very good last second ult. Needs to try and save Jensen, but Diamond found it. Azazel plays a big pulverize. Stales on the front side. He's getting burnt down by the marksman of Cloud9. And Ligrish dives in. Execution is good, but Kira is able to find the trade kill. Now Blabber, he's forced away. A sneak, he's left out to dry. Killer Instinct supercharges out, but he still gets stunned blind by Kira's Q. And Gavin, that might be enough to seal this game. Yeah, it certainly should be once again, Kira's walls coming up clutch. The Anivia God able to turn the game around and they'll march towards the Nexus. Inhibitor dead, it's two only in the defense. The rookies on Cloud9, Zazel and Blabba must defend a seemingly impossible situation. But Gambit, they'll just ravage down these Nexus turrets. They'll tie up Zazel in the steadfast presence. They'll put the Glacial Storm on the feet of Blabber and force him down with a stun. As Gambit, they'll tie up the series in style. And all of the win conditions that Raz highlighted at the start of the day, the innovation, the carry bot lane, and ability to neutralize Licorice were all there in that game for Gambit. They turn it around.